This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where I'm speaking with Marianne and Camilla, joint founders of Wolves Lane Flower Company. Marianne and Camilla are on a mission to inspire everyone to have a go at growing flowers and are part of a new wave of farmer florists putting the environment first. Their new book, How to Grow the Flowers, charts a year at Wolves Lane Flower Company and in an easy to understand and digest fashion shows you what to do and when to do it in order to create your own flower farm at any scale. We began Wolves Lane Flower Company back in April 2017. Um, I had moved to the area in 2014 and on actually that first day of, of moving in my husband and I wandered down um, down the road which is about five streets down and um, discovered this amazing slightly disheveled rambling site covered in glass houses and you know felt like a bit of a um, well, it was a total surprise, a kind of hidden gem and something you're not expecting to stumble across on your doorstep. And um, at the time I was, um, I, Marianne, was working as a theatre producer um, and Camilla was working in fashion. We were both increasingly fed up of um, sitting you know, you get into jobs like that to do something creative and more and more as you get more senior, you're you're spending more and more time doing spreadsheets and dealing with the demands of whoever your client or creative team is. And we were both ready for a change. So Camilla had actually just decided to quit her job, right? You were like, I've had enough. Yeah, I was done in. (laughs) And we were having breakfast with another um, mutual friend and we, we... I just started talking about this this space and said, oh, you should just come down and see it. And with this kind of producer's head of like coming up with, you know, wanting to facilitate ideas and also a bit of naive optimism. I said, I just think there might be something exciting we could do there. So we went down one morning and had a poke about, which I think we must have looked very odd because it was 9am and we were wearing clothes you'd wear to work and um yeah anyway we were very intrigued and that day I then discovered buried very deep on Haringey Council's website Haringey Council owned the site but they were looking for people to take on the site to take it over basically and we then went through this real roller coaster six month period of putting together a business plan and liaising with the council and having these meetings with other people who were looking to take over the site. It was all at times a bit cloak and dagger. And there was a lot of like, uh, it's sort of small, but very intense politics between all the people that were, you know, it's a site that lots of people feel very strongly in and have a, a sense of ownership over. But after that period um the the kind of joyful outcome was that we didn't get the whole site to have to manage which I think if we'd done that we would have ultimately become fundraisers and caretakers and it would have not been something where we could really prioritize growing but we were given a glass house and a half to um grow in which were at the beginning you know they had heating pipes in them there was no soil they were covered in metal staging they were you know derelict essentially there was nothing alive in them and yeah we started growing from that point so that was April 2017 which is as you all know it's not a brilliant time to to start trying to set up a cut flower garden because it's the season's really got got away from you by that that point but I think that was that's always what we say has been brilliant about working together is that we just maybe we didn't know enough so that was quite useful that we just got going and we also had each other to bolster ourselves and and just just try it and not wait for the perfect optimum moment. Yeah I think there's a lot to be said for that just jumping in and kind of seeing what happens sometimes people particularly more experienced gardeners get a bit hamstrung by feeling they're doing things at the wrong time and actually sometimes if you just crack on and do it it all comes together anyway one of the things that I noticed straight away picking up your book was that your title is a nod to Constance Spry and I thought it was interesting how her work kind of influences yours to a degree what is it about her stuff that inspires you 
I think, um, you know, if you read Constance Fry's work, she has been saying um, all the things that, that that we say and that many of our colleagues and friends in the British um, flower movement, uh, you know, say. It, it, what, what we say in this book isn't new. Constance Spry was saying this decades ago, which is to look around you, to appreciate the seasons, to work seasonally and inherently if you're if if you're seasonal then you'll be more sustainable and those are the two major parameters of Wall Zone Flower Company that that's what we wanted to do and what we wanted to offer to other florists in London was like seasonal and sustainable flowers. I think as well um Constance Sprite she, she wrote a huge number of books but what is in is is present in all of them is a kind of curiosity to trial different ingredients and just um experiment and I think that's what really fueled her creative design and I think that's something that um has been so true for us that we we don't have a huge amount of space but there are already existing um mature trees and shrubs and even though we've been there for five and a bit years on any given day you can wander around and something new will catch your eye and something that you think oh that will be that's just right for that florist who's asked us to cut in um in that palette or we've got a wedding and that those leaves turning now just will be perfect for the bridal bouquet or whatever and I think we really identified with that sort of spirit of curiosity which is born out of working with what you've got rather than trying to acquire something of everything Mm. See, I'm a big fan of foraging for and and using kind of what I suppose other people would think had gone over or, you know, things that have dried on the plant or or just just things that other people might not necessarily reach for if they're making a bouquet. And the reason I do that is because I hate cutting my flowers. It's like a physical pain to me. So I wondered, if <laughs> is there anything you can tell me that would convince me that I should cut my flowers? Well, I mean, that's... I mean, you'll know this. We probably don't need to tell you this. There's so many crops that if you, the more you cut them, the more flowers you'll get. You're, you know, you're promoting growth. But also it's, it's that, you know, it's always, it's that cultural difference, isn't it? Of like, you know, we've worked with, with, with gardeners, gardeners that we like really respect and admire and they hate us cutting anything from their gardens because it's that, it's the difference between like growing something as a crop and growing a garden which you know has form and structure and color all these things have gone into its thought whereas we don't think about those things so much um um in in the cutting garden but it is it is a it is a difficult thing to get your head around I think if, if you're not growing something as a crop I think as well something we were talking about the other day is with old you know stately homes in in bygone days used to have what was called then a reserve garden that was round the corner out of eye shot of the main house where the flowers that would be cut by the head gardener and brought into the house were were grown there and they might mirror some of those flowers that were used within the garden um now of course none of us for the most part have space for a reserve garden around the corner because there perhaps isn't any corners in our garden we we need all the space that we've, we we can get but you can do things like for example put tulips into a crate and grow those tulips specifically that you know you're going to pull them up and and use them in your home and you might just find a little corner somewhere to to put that crate and it doesn't have to then mess with the border that you've got in your own garden and and you still get the joy of looking out of the window when you're doing the washing up and enjoying those tulips in situ too Mm, that's a good idea speaking of which how do you keep things like squirrels off your tulip bulbs yeah chicken wire is your friend so we now grow our tulips in raised beds it's an easier system than digging a big trench but we sort of we might empty the bed out a little bit lay the tulips on top and then put more compost over it so it's it, it's it's much more efficient but also what it means by having the frame of the bed is that we can quite easily lie um a kind of full strip of chicken wire that covers that entire bed and you can secure it quite easily i mean you don't need to do it you can do that just on on bare soil of course but um we found that's quite an efficient way we don't even know if we, it's squirrels that upset our beds or we know that is a popular problem but um 
the foxes on our site love to dig up the, the bulbs as well. So the chicken wire um, covering the bed and then we, we use road pins because they're super strong. We use them as plant supports and it's just a, another way to use them. But you can use pegs or um, bamboo canes or anything to just keep that chicken wire in place. And once the shoots have come up, then the squirrels tend to lose interest, we find. Yeah, good tip. And I was wondering, thinking about next year, I'm always really keen to keep ahead of the curve when it comes to colours and things like that. And I wondered if there's any colours that are particularly interesting you for 2023. And also if there's anything new and exciting in the way of varieties that you're trialling. Do you know what? We get asked this question a lot. And I think because we sit slightly outside of, um, you know, like London floristry, because obviously we are florists, but um, we're not you know we're not we're not like big commercial florists like some of the people that 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 we that we supply to so we sit sort of slightly outside of like the pinterest boards i think one thing that we've like really noticed a lot of is like a real merging of that more contemporary structured look and the cottage garden so like the cottage garden isn't going anywhere people still really want that garden gathered look but it it's sort of fusing a bit more with a with a contemporary look which does open up the palette a bit more what we found so if like maybe you know a couple of seasons ago everyone just wanted like blush and smudge now there's like way more room for color and pops and accents which is just music to our ears because obviously we love color and as much as we understand why brides want that slightly like sludgier romantic yeah look it's um it it's wonderful to be able to grow and supply lots of um lots of color and like a full variety because because uh, often we we've had lots of seasons where we get asked for things like nude and nude isn't really a color that exists naturally within the cutting well within nature so there are some things like a phlox creme brulee or um bella poc tulip that you can you can just about shoehorn into that category but really you know flowers are colorful because they attract pollinators so when we can celebrate that and um uh, and that can become fashionable then it's it's going to be more successful for everyone and hopefully people are getting less scared of surprising color combinations it doesn't all have to be tonal it doesn't all have to be like yeah incredibly soft and romantic but we can I I don't know maybe the fact that we're going through a turbulent time means that people are are, are seeking out joy in those color palettes more and more yeah good point and also this episode's going out towards the end of October are you doing anything in your gardens at the moment? And I'm thinking particularly, are you kind of prepping for Christmas? There's loads in your book, like in the way of projects that you can do, but I just wondered if you could pick a, one or two out that people might want to try. So floristry projects? Well, either that or in your garden, I suppose. You know, kind of what are you doing in general to prep for the season ahead? Autumn is such a busy time in the cutting garden. So like the big thing that we do in October is we um, plant narcissi, we start planting out all of our hardies um, that we've already, already sown sort of in um, September. We do do a certain amount of like um, chitting or like pre-sprouting um, ranunculus corms, or we at least get them into soil, um, even if we don't cover them, because we find that sets them up for success a little bit better. And then we plant them out a little bit later. We're, we're just very lucky in London because it's so mild that we don't have to get everything in the ground, like, you know, before sort of like the end of November, we 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 have a bit more leeway, and but we certainly need to start dealing with the corms in October because if not, it just gets too cold. And also, I think a lot of people, if they haven't already, are um, putting together their seed orders. And I and you had some really good tips in the book as well about that. Is there anything that you could share that might be useful? Yeah, I think as the winter period creeps towards us it's it's a really great time to take stock think about what worked well in your garden this year what you would like to do differently and to um keep that in mind when you're thinking about what you're going to buy because if you just look through a seed catalog like some of them are so tempting now they put all the varieties in kind of colored so you you feel it's like looking through sweet a sweet shop window it's just it's incredibly tantalising. So if you 
try and create a, a stronger brief in your head. You think of yourself as the client and you're creating a clear list of parameters of what you have um, capacity to grow. And that it comes down to how much time do you really have to dedicate to your garden? Because, you know, you don't want to be starting off a huge number of you know plants from seed if you're not going to then have the time to tend to them because the more failure you have the more you create this narrative in your head that you're no good at growing and it's really bad for morale so be really realistic about how much time you've got really be honest with yourself about how much sun you have the last garden that I had was very small and it was north facing and I you know unsurprisingly love cottage garden aesthetic so I, I wanted to have roses and hollyhocks and campanulas and in a north facing garden with very very heavy clay soil that just dried out totally in summer it just didn't really work and I had to it took me a couple of years when I first got that garden before I was doing this at all to come to terms with the fact that what I wanted to grow just wasn't going to suit that site so try and be really realistic about the growing conditions that you're working with perhaps yeah so what what have I missed time space obviously you have to grow what you love because if you don't grow I think sometimes people can try and overthink it and perhaps if they are growing because they want to cut some things and use whether that's for a friend's wedding or they want to start trying to sell some posies people can try and be a bit too strategic and think oh well you know we did this a few seasons ago we're thinking well lysianthus is something that florists really love we don't love lysianthus because they feel like a flower that is really easy to get hold of in the flower market. And we kind of neglected the lysianthus a little bit and we would never feel instinctively drawn to them at the point of cutting. So it just didn't end up being a useful crop for us because we didn't feel invested in it. So really make sure that you feel connected yeah. to what you're growing. One, like one of the things that Marianne um, is starting off um, now um in you know in a few days time is our is our sweet peas and like sweet peas are really like Marianne's first love um whereas they're really not mine so she always takes control of that aspect of the growing because you know she makes sure that like she orders in like the seeds that you know that, that we're going to grow of those specific varieties because she absolutely loves sweet peas whereas I you know there are different varieties that I love that in different flowers and sweet peas just don't they don't sing to me but they sing to her and and then just be very selective because you do want to order everything. And I know in the first couple of seasons, we did just that. We ordered so much stuff. And then as you go through into the, you know, from February onwards, when you're sowing, everything gets disorganized. You've got all these seed packets. You can't keep track of what you've sowed, what you've still got left to do. And it can feel really overwhelming. And again, that's just another barrier to success. So, yeah when I put the sweet pea order in over the weekend I had to be really really restrained because I wanted to order like 16 varieties but we no, don't have room for 16 varieties. no one even if there's only 10 seeds per packet no one has room for 160 sweet pea plants so I have to be to be restrained to remember also that we're not a sweet pea flower farm we're not solely growing sweet peas so um yeah I think it's all about restraint and being realistic yeah, I think I had probably about 25 varieties of sweet peas last year. At least I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually quite a bit more because I'm sweet <laughs> pea mad as well. But thinking about sweet peas, how do you keep cutting them throughout the season? Because obviously the first ones are the best ones with long stems and they just get shorter and shorter. How do you cope with that? Is there a trick? There's all this advice about um, cutting, you know, the tendrils. To be honest, like those, like you say, that the first ones are the the first stems, the most usable. But we very regularly get asked for the trails anyway. So unless so that's cutting the whole length of, um, you know, a, a mm. side shoot with all the flowers on it, not but, just the individual stems. Which, right. which is a much more realistic way for us to cut sweet peas anyway, because the problem with sweet peas is that more often than not, we actually just can't cut them fast enough, and then as you'll know that and they go to seed so actually cutting cutting the trails means that it's much more usable for the florist after that after that first stem and then we actually keep the plants going for for a really decent amount of time inside and outside the glasshouse 
Mm, interesting. Yeah, that's a really good point. And and on that sort of subject of flowers that you love that make good cut flowers, is there anything that you absolutely love that you can't grow because it isn't a very good cut flower? There's so much that we <laughs> that we love that is just not really that useful. I mean, from the you know from from you know like all over our um, allotment when we first took it on, we had forget me not everywhere and we both adore forget me not is it very useful no but it's just it just gives you so much joy um those little um what are they called those like those little perennial anemones that we both love they're just so wonderful but like a wooden anemone yeah yeah and they're just I mean they're no good for cutting I mean they're also like incredibly short but there's that difference isn't it in the garden of what looks good in the garden and what is then useful for cutting and there is so much that I actually am really grateful for that sits outside of cutting because then we can appreciate it in a different way I think as flower growers sometimes you can look at things at least I mean I can't talk for you but I sometimes look at things with this lens of is it going to be useful and actually like really what we're trying to constantly encourage people to do is have like a better more tangible connection with nature so I'm I'm constantly reminding myself like is it useful but also is it beneficial like mm. is it is it just good for the garden and imagine if bindweed cut can you imagine <laughs> we would just see pinterest boards like out coming out of our ears of people doing bindweed arches i mean those amazing big white trumpety flowers they're they're incredible and if they if unfortunately they don't last at all but yeah I reckon bindweed would be like the runaway success if it did cut <laughs> yeah you're probably right actually uh yeah cause it's <laughs> it's kind of got that almost it looks like a painting it's, it's got that sort of artistic quality to it absolutely it's sort of like um yeah George O'Keefe-esque mm. just it's like something kind of you would imagine almost from a storybook it's so large and generous and yeah I think bindweed I often think how great it would be if you could actually preserve it in a vase. Yeah, yeah it's a shame that you can't. Come on, bindweed, get your act together. <laughs> I know. Might as well be useful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the other thing that is very much on trend and is would be, I'd say, a firm favourite with people at the moment is dried flowers. And I'm wondering if now people may have missed the boat, depending on where they are in the country, to dry their flowers for next year. But if they wanted to... How would they go about that? The thing with drying flowers is all you need is a weatherproof space. So, you know, a space that isn't going to let any moisture in and it, and it needs to be dark. So that could be a wardrobe. I think the problem is sometimes people get addicted to doing things like drying flowers and then their home starts filling up. <laughs> There's a kind of where a wardrobe is, is designed for clothes. You suddenly start filling it more and more with all these different grasses and uh, straw flowers and and it can all get a bit stressful because you're trying to share your your house with something that um yeah is designed for the outdoors but as Camilla says you don't need a dedicated space you just want somewhere where the color will be preserved and that's what the dark is useful for right and mm -hmm. yeah mold is your enemy so you don't want to be drying things anywhere where the, the damp is going to get in so as you say Sarah it's it is getting a, a bit tricky as we get into October to be avoiding that damp. But if you still have late stems or something like a status they'll, or, or straw flower, that's still great to harvest now. And you can hang that, even if it's just out of direct sunlight, I used to hang um, some stems in my back staircase and um, down to my back garden. And uh, I would find they, they dried nicely there. And it, it was light, but it wasn't something directly lit and that that was fine so just try and not get too overzealous because you you will find whoever you share your house with probably gets a bit fed up if you um literally fill it with all the potentials that you can still try and preserve at this point in the season we're definitely speaking from experience here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thought you might be <laughs> i'm also kind of picturing all the little bugs scuttling out of your flowers into your, into your yeah, wardrobe they all kind of wake up and and come running out when they come back into your nice warm house so yeah particularly if you're thinking about a wardrobe just maybe let them have a kind of first phase nearer the back door first for those friends to to vacate it is a good time though to be thinking about dried flowers in terms of like where we are in the season because people get a bit snooty about straw flower and status but then 
it's a good time to think about how grateful you are for them. Like now that we, now that we're sort of edging into the fallow period and then to remember to sow them. So to remember to order the seed now and then to sow them in sort of March, April, because you're just so grateful for the color um, over this period when everything's very gray and brown. Yeah, that's a really good point. So if anybody's thinking about cutting more of their flowers next year or if they're thinking of trying it for the first time i know this is a really tough question is there any one flower that you would say yeah that's a winner that's going to keep you going for a long period and it's going to be good in a vase well there's different categories right Mm. so it depends on how much money you want to invest how much time as we said and and how long you're going to be keeping that garden for so yeah we do, if, if if you know if someone's like short on budget but like you know has the time we'd say you know start sowing they've sort of slightly missed the boat now but you know definitely so in february and sow things like Olea, agrostemma they're really generous they cut and come again you just you really can't cut it quickly enough and if if there's somebody a little bit like you that finds it quite painful to cut flowers out of their garden it just won't be a problem with those crops corn flower as well is like quite ubiquitous but you don't need to get like the classic blue variety like we grow this really gorgeous very very deep dark purple called black ball that just looks so brilliant when it's paired with sort of like pops of orange or like pinks it just sets them off but I would say probably if you really hold a gun to our heads and we have to choose something I think we'd probably always say grow a rose because you're able to cut from that the whole way through the year sometimes you might even be rewarded in December with the the kind of odd flower bud and so it's it's kind of a plant that can keep you company throughout the year and you have these real moments of incredibly um, flowery abundance but it's kind of quite a consistent one of course I'm talking about like a repeat flower or something like David Austin varieties and um if I'm gonna make Camilla choose one what would you say I think it's like for us it's just got to be Lady of Shalott for a David Austin repeat flowering rose it's incredibly generous it's like beautiful sort of peachy rose and it's and it's it's really vigorous um you know we grow a lot of roses they're not all David Austin um and and Lady of Shalott is, is like the gift that keeps on giving that one and, and and Litchfield Angel, those are although all I would say about Litchfield Angel is obviously um white roses do tarnish in the rain um considerably. I mean, one thing that I really love doing with roses, obviously they only start flowering in sort of May, but I love the act of looking after roses. Like I really find it therapeutic to prune roses because I feel like you're actively doing something that is going to benefit them and, and and you see that benefit like so clearly when they when they start to grow and then flower the following season. Yeah, same. I agree. Roses are my favourite thing to prune, actually. And yes, agreed about Lady of Shalott. It is an absolute winner and it's really good if you don't have a particularly light garden as well. It does quite well in sort of semi-shade. So it's a fantastic rose. So yes, fully support. And obviously there's scent. And I think if you're going to really boil it down to anything, you always have to prioritise something that you're going to be rewarded with an amazing fragrance as well as beautiful petals. Thank you very much to Camilla and Marianne for a lovely chat and for creating a beautiful, sustainable space and for sharing it through the book and through their flowers. And thank you, of course, to you for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford now to warn you about yet another bug to worry your brassicas, as if there weren't enough. Brassicas are a genus of plants within the mustard family that our cruciferous vegetables and coal crops belong to. And over time... Their extensive cultivation has resulted in a number of insect species becoming brassica-specific pests, seemingly unaffected by glucosinolates, which are the brassica plant's natural defence chemicals. One of the most common of these pests is the cabbage whitefly, Aliarodes prolatella, which can be found throughout Britain at almost any time of the year. Cabbage whitefly are just over a millimetre in length, and although they resemble tiny little white moths, They're actually sap-sucking hemipteran bugs, and in the same taxonomic order as aphids. Adult whitefly congregate together on the underside of young leaves, where the males and females will pair and mate. Their eggs are then usually laid in circles, each attached to the leaf surface by a basal spike. Then after a few days they split open, to reveal a tiny nymph that crawls off to find a leaf vein 
where it inserts its needle-like mouthparts and begins sucking out plant sap. It then sheds its skin, then remains stuck to the leaf for the rest of its juvenile life. Connected into the leaf's vascular system, plant sap continually flows into the nymph over the following weeks, with the excess being excreted as sticky honeydew. But to avoid drowning in its own honeydew, the nymph stores it within an orifice at the end of its body, before flicking it away with a spoon-like appendage called a ligula. But as the honeydew rains down, it invariably lands on the lower leaves, forming a sugary layer that allows black sooty moulds to establish and grow. Eventually, after three to four weeks, the nymph stops feeding. Its skin hardens, and an adult whitefly begins forming within, which a week or so later hatches out and flies off to the younger leaves, where it congregates with others, just like the previous generation of adults had done, to mate and lay eggs. Effectively controlling cabbage whitefly would likely be tricky, since they'll be difficult to access amongst the plants, and also the airborne adults will be continuously reinfesting. But since the nymphs will only be on the lower surfaces of older leaves, it may not be necessary to control them, unless the infestation is very severe and the edible parts of the plants are becoming contaminated with black sooty mould. In which case, a proprietary soap-based product, or even a chemical one, might have to be used, provided it's approved for use on edible plants, with clear instructions on application and harvest intervals. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.